There you go, Bruce. So we got a new president a few weeks ago, and at one of the meet and greets, one of the faculty said, what about athletics? Aren't they a distraction to an R1 university that is focused on research? And the new president said, he echoed my sentiments, no, those athletics, first of all, they're a tremendously power recruiting tool for new students. They want to come here because of our athletics, but also when I go to the football games and the football team does something good, all of our students stand up, all of the faculty, all of the alumni in unison, everybody associated with this university for, for 50, 60 years stands up in unison. And for me, that makes me proud to be here. Um, I'm now I'm here not because of athletics at all, but the same thing happens with department seminars. This is a time when our department comes together with our graduate students, our faculty, people affiliated with the department, and I'm thrilled to see so many people here from other distinguished guests. Um, I, I'm, it's, it, we're going to have a great fall seminar series. Um, before I introduce John, I want to mention Bill Kustis is here with us from USDA. He and John have worked together a long time, and uh, he came early from Beltsville, Washington, because John is here. So that's, that's the audience. If you look at statistics from scientists, you can go on Google Scholar and see people's statistics. If you go, or, or ResearchGate, and so right before the seminar, I called up these numbers for John. And 34,000 citations to his paper, I can tell you, I'm pretty proud after a long career of approaching 10,000. And John's got 34,000. It's just incredible. 289 publications, 67,000 reads. Those are numbers. That, that tell you this guy has had a long, very distinguished career. But I can tell you from personal experience, his biggest impact is on graduate students over his career. I was never at a school where he was at, but through professional meetings, I got to know him, and John had a big impact on my career early on. And I've seen him do that with not, what do you have, a hundred graduate students, I think, over your career? I mean, it's just amazing. Um, Fifty. And it's a long, long impact. Fifty. Oh, fifty. <laughs> hundred people that you've worked with, maybe. Oh. Something like that. Oh, more than that. Yeah, all right. <laughs> so we're honored to have him. He's a long history of working on energy and mass transfer in agricultural systems. Um, I can t also tell you that maybe the first half, two-thirds of his career was hardcore science, and then he became, got this status of like a, a sage in the discipline and started to have insights that m mere mortals like the rest of us <laughs> like putting things together. And that's really made it interesting to see that. So. Um, He's going to talk to us today about interdisciplinary science. And as you know from the advertisements, he would like to have a dialogue more than just him talking. Um, so as he gets going, keep your questions in mind. And I, and I might say, with talking about a sage, there's one other scientist that cut his, his reputation on having dialogues, always asking people questions. <laughs> Socrates. <laughs> <laughs> so, with that, would you welcome, please, John Norman. Is it on? Yes. Thank you. Oh, boy. I have, I have never had an introduction like that, <laughs> where, where my, got, my name got mentioned along with Socrates. <laughs> uh, thank you, Bruce, <laughs> and thank you for inviting me. Uh, I appreciate that. 
and in spite of the fact that I'm a bit terrified trying this experiment, uh, I've done this before. I had a dialogue with a community of people, but never in an academic setting. And things are a little different here. I don't know if maybe you've noticed, students and faculty, it's a different world in the economic, in the ac ac academic world. It's a little bit different. <clears throat> so I wanted to try this here to see if it would work. Um, and that, so my preference here is for you to ask some questions about interdisciplinary science. The more specific, the more likely I am to be able to give a coherent answer. Um, general questions, you don't know what I'm going to say to them. Uh, and I don't know what I'm going to say to them. Uh, so what I'm hoping is that I'm hoping that this works. I'm not sure if it will or not. Um, I thought it might be useful to give you a little bit of introduction to, to my career, where I've been, some of general thoughts about what I've done. I was born in a mining town in northern Minnesota, a place where there were more bars on the main street than anywhere you've probably ever been. So <clears throat> it was a wild place to grow up. I went to uh, high school with, like everybody's, 56 graduates, so not a very big one. Went to a junior college, started out in engineering, then I found out what engineers did, and I quit engineering. Because <laughs> you know? I did not want to sit in a corner of a factory someplace looking up handbooks doing cookbook solutions to problems on assembly lines and things. That didn't appeal to me at all. But I didn't know what to do, so I went into physics. What else? I thought I'll be a high school teacher. Well, that would be a useful occupation. I like people, and teachers get a lot of face time with people. Um, and I thought I'll do a five-year program, and I'll get a teaching certificate and a physics BS at the same time. And after a year, I thought, I'm not staying here for five years. <laughs> so I just quit the, the, the teaching certificate and got a BS in physics without really thinking about what I was going to do with that. But eventually, I ended up in the soil science department and using physics outside, which was a thrill to me. I mean, I grew up outside, and I could apply physics to, you know, ordinary things. Trees, soils, climate. Um, and <coughs> that was, that's a pretty big step for me, to, to make that step to the, another campus. This is at the University of Minnesota. Physics was in Minneapolis. Agriculture was in St. Paul. I got a monitor, got experience in monitoring. It was a 24-7, 365 monitoring station, maintaining equipment, collecting data. And I got to see the plagues associated with trying to keep a field station running year after year. Um, I got a master's, did some work on applying time series analysis to temperature profiles to get thermal conductivity as a function of moisture content. Went to, did my PhD at Wisconsin. Started working on light in plant canopies. And that was about the time that they learned quanta were important. So uh, my task was to build a sensor that had a quantum response. You can just buy them now few hundred bucks, you can buy one, half a dozen companies. Well, there weren't any around then. And, and that, it was a pretty interesting instrument challenge. So I have a lot of respect now for instrument companies, a lot of respect. All you have to do is try to build one instrument yourself, 
and you'll buy the next one. I guarantee you, you'll buy the next one. But it was good experience, and I got to make a lot of measurements with them, and then I did some modeling of, of the light interception, canopy architecture, these kinds of things. It was fun. The first paper I read was by Mansi and Psyche, who are Japanese. It was in German, because they published it in 1953, and uh, that was the time when the, the Japanese still weren't really friendly with the US, but they were with Germany, so these Japanese people published their paper in German. So I had to get a German translation. It was a beautiful piece of work, just a beautiful piece of work. Um, and it was cited a lot at the time. But anyway, that was a, the PhD, and I, I got the opportunity to do a postdoc in Scotland. So my wife and I went there for 14 months and uh, learned how the Europeans live differently from us. And they do live differently from us. I mean, they take two months vacations and <laughs> they never miss a coffee break. If you, you aren't at a tea break or a coffee break, they're gonna come and find you <laughs> and drag you back there. And I hated coffee. <laughs> and I tried to drink coffee, and oh, it was just a nightmare. I, finally, I got a black cup, and I put water in it, and they couldn't tell it wasn't coffee. <laughs> That's how I had survived there in their tea breaks. But that was a fantastic experience. And any of you students get an opportunity to do a postdoc in, in another country, grab it. Do it. It'll transform your life, to totally transform your life. I have colleagues all over the world, and it all started in Europe. It's a wonderful experience to do. You'll never, you'll never regret that. Um, but from there, I got a letter in the mail one day from a place called University Park, Pennsylvania, offering me a job in meteorology. And I didn't know where University Park was. <laughs> so I went to the library and got a book to see if I could look up where University Park, Pennsylvania was. I couldn't find it. I was in the library, the big atlas, all these little towns and things that wasn't there. I thought, well, I'll say yes. What am I going to do? How hard is it to look for a job in the US from Scotland? Right? So I just wrote back and said, yeah, I'll take it. And and then I got a letter from a faculty member, and this was his home address in the back of it, and it was State College. So then I went back to the library and found out where State College is. It's in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of Pennsylvania. And that was another good experience, but there it was meteorology. And happens to be the seat of some of the most prominent turbulence meteorologists in the world were at Penn State. I knew very little about turbulence. I knew something because one of my fellow grad students at Wisconsin was working with eddy covariants and making measurements of fluxes of heat and momentum over crops and such. So I, I watched a lot of things. And he wanted to do an experiment with coherence. And coherence is a complicated concept, but you're trying to figure out how do the eddies in the atmosphere work. And he's a brilliant theoretician. And all you needed to do was set up seven turbulence anemometers in an array, right, and measure all of them at the same time, 10 or 20 times a second for every one of these three dimensions on seven, so that's 21. And build, you know, I have to get the sensors. And at the time, the sensors were $30,000 a piece. And you could get an $80,000 grant. So what you're going to do, well, I, I built my own. <laughs> I spent the first year in wind tunnels trying to figure out how to make a turbulent sensor that was reliable. And that was another lesson in building equipment. You think I'd have learned my lesson the first time 
but I went back and did this a second time with wind. And I, I learned some really powerful things from this. It, it was a successful experiment. We published a paper, like we all do. But it had some irritating pieces to it. And one of them was that we were in the Nittany Valley. Everybody here knows where the Nittany Valley is? No. Nittany Valley is in the center part of Pennsylvania. It's where State College is located. These are wi fairly wide, flat valleys with big ridges, Appalachian ridges. When the wind was coming down the valley, we had 10 miles of fetch, 10 miles of, because we worked in the fall, winter, and spring. Right? So nothing was growing there. Beautiful, perfect sites for doing turbulence work. Everything worked beautiful when the wind came down the valley. But then when the wind came over the ridge and up to us, it didn't work. Because the wind would shift direction 180 degrees in 10 minutes. And whoa. And the, there were methods for doing these corrections, something they call a coordinate transformation. Well, you apply a coordinate transformation, it made everything worse. So I thought, this subject is driving me nuts. I got to get out of this. So I started to work on a model. I called it Cupid. It's really a good history behind why I picked that name. But it's a name, it's not an acronym. And it, I decided I want to do a model of vegetation. And Cupid, I started with photosynthesis and light and architecture, because this is the basis for the thing. You have to have some structure to build it all on. And, uh, I thought, I'm getting out of turbulence, because this is a mess. This is, I don't, I don't even know what's going on with these wind patterns. Uh -huh. And uh, I started working on vegetation stuff, and I thought, I should be able to shift my emphasis over onto something more with vegetation, more biology. But it wasn't going to happen at Penn State. So then I got an offer from Nebraska, and I went there, worked on physiology. And at the, this time, I was always building this Cupid model in the background and trying to add things to it as I learned about things. The vegetation, the atmosphere above it, the soil itself, heat and flow, water flow, all of these different functions that was going on. Spent the time at Nebraska, worked in physiology, built a few more prototype <laughs> instruments. <laughs> Started to realize I actually like to work with my hands. Right? And building instruments is a good way to do that. So I, I just kept doing that. But I realized from this model that we, there's a few things we need to be able to measure fairly easily. Of, of a canopy, and one of them is the leaf area. Well, the way we were doing it at the time was you cut the plant down, take all the leaves off, put them through an area meter, or measure their length and width, and then, and it takes all day for one person to make a few samples. And it, you hire half a dozen undergraduates to go do this in the summertime, and it's terrible. And while I was at Penn State, I learned something about integral inversions and how you could use the, I, I got to thinking I can use the light, I can measure the light under the canopy and, it, and infer the leaf area that had to be there in order for the light to have the properties it has. And I can do that in 30 seconds or a minute. <clears throat> so I've worked on that, built some instruments, when I went to Nebraska, I worked with Lycor, a company. They made even spectacular instruments. Smaller, better, faster, easier, automatic recording. And they're still selling that device. Um, and so that was a really successful thing. But I never actually published it. So, because I thought the company would do better if 
you don't publish it because then somebody else just makes it and competes with them. And they were nice enough to do all that engineering work. Um, so there wasn't, I think there were, the paper didn't get published until, I don't know, five years after, something like that. Uh, one of my students did it. But that, that was a, one important thing that came from that model. So this model, you need to have that leaf input. That's a fundamental input. You've got to have it. So you need a decent way to get it. But, it. but the ideas came from that model, the idea that you need this piece of data if you're going to understand how the vegetation works. Because that showed up in the mathematics big time. Um, <clears throat> well, that, the next thing that showed up was the leaf physiological properties. Right? You have to know something about them. So I got, made another sensor. And this one is a gas exchange system. And that was one of the more frustrating instruments to build. But it was successful. And in, worked with this company again, and the company made a beautiful device, right? Sold hundreds of them. And <clears throat> then I had a lot of data for my model because all kinds of people were collecting data so I could understand things a lot better in this model from using their data. I didn't have to collect the data anymore. They collected the data. And so the model advanced. Anyway, I was there for a few years, 10, I guess. I went to Wisconsin, where I retired. Spent 20 years at Wisconsin. There I moved into the soil and started to integrate the, what was going on in the vegetation with the soil and ran into a really serious problem, which was the soil surface. And this is where we get into the interdisciplinary struggles. Because the atmospheric people, or the engineers, the people who deal with runoff, the deal with wind, rain, all these kinds of things, it's a series of different disciplines that do this, and they don't talk to each other. They don't publish in the same journals, and they don't talk to each other. So this, they deal with everything from the surface up. The soil scientist deals with everything from the surface down. Nobody deals with the surface. <laughs> so what happens is the engineers and the meteorologists, they just assume some what they call a boundary condition, which means that they pick whatever they want, whatever they want that gets their piece to work. You pick it, you just choose it out of whatever. And the soil people set up their boundary condition and they pick it. But nothing ever happens through the surface. So in this model, that was the first thing I had to do was I had to figure out how am I going to get this equations up in the canopy, which I knew really well, and the equations in the soil, which I knew really well, bah, I could not get them to work at the surface. Everything goes haywire at the surface. Because we don't really know what's happening there. So the model was the source of understanding that these disciplines don't meet the way they need to. All right? And that was a really hard problem. And over time, it just got harder. Um, we finally made a lot of progress on it and solved it. After 10 years of working with a dozen different people, we made some progress with it. But the trouble is it's obscure. I mean, it's more complex. So you see all of those citations up there. There's something like 15 citations on the solution to this problem in 25 years. Nobody cares. <laughs> <Okay>? <laughs> Nobody cares about that problem. Um, 
it was exciting to solve it. I thought, it should make a difference. It didn't. It just, it's just ignored. So there's a, some challenges here that have to do with these different disciplines. Um, there's a couple of more problems I worked on that were interdisciplinary. And Bill here and I have worked together for many years on some of these problems. Those problems have a lot of interest. And a whole lot of those 34,000 come from the work we did together. That's really popular. So you hit, it's hit and miss. My, I learned some lessons from that. But I think I want you to start asking some questions. I've sort of given you a thumbnail here. John, I'd like to sort of lead off with one of the things that's really valuable about knowing you is the long history you have in science. You were doing important science when I was a teenager. How has this issue of interdisciplinary collaboration evolved over 50, 60 years? Because we, we talk about it all the time. We're going to do interdisciplinary research. How do you see that evolving from early in your career to now? I, in my impression, we talk about it more. Whether we really do it, it's another matter. But we yeah. for sure talk about it. Yeah. <coughs> Can you repeat the question? Can you repeat the question? Hmm? Oh, you, repeat sir? the question. Ah, uh, boy. Uh, how, do, how does the... How, how, I guess really what you're asking is, how did I really uh, orchestrate this career so that I could actually engage in all of these interdisciplinary activities and is it transferable to anybody else maybe I'm sort of adding that to it um, well for me I realize now after I retire I have a lot better insight into my career if you'd asked me this when I was working I would not have known how to answer it but I have some thoughts now and one of them is, is that, to me personally, the most important activity I have in my life is my relationships with other people. It's the people who matter the most to me. Um, I value those connections with, with individuals. Um, that's, that's really the most important to me. Uh, and having a having a kind of dynamic interaction with people that is mutually beneficial to me and to them both. I want, I want us both to walk away from this thing um, excited or knowing more than we knew before we met. So the personal element is really important. So when I ran into people in the university, um, like when I went to Nebraska, and I went to the chancellor's uh, cocktail party for new, new faculty in the university. I met an entomologist, and we hit it off. I really liked this guy. And I think he liked me, and we had just this wonderful conversation. We worked together for the 10 years I was there, studying the role of spider mites on corn which is a really serious problem in agriculture in arid, semi-arid areas. It was a highly productive relationship. So periodically, we'd sit down over a beer, well, not usually beer, but something, some drink we both enjoyed, <laughs> um, and talked about how I, I told him personally, I, I got more out of this relationship than I put into it. And he said the same thing. He got more out of this relationship than he put into it. That's, the, for me in my career, there's nothing more fulfilling than that, personally. To have that kind of a relationship with somebody where you realize 
the productivity that's coming out of two of us together here is 10 times what it'd be if either of us were trying to do something separately. It's a huge multiplication effect in that. And it's in the relationship. It's buried in the mystery of a relationship. You know, I mean, you know, we got, we got this split brain, this left brain and this right brain, this left brain that's analyzing everything to death and looking at the minutia, the reductionism in science is very much this left hemisphere functioning. But we also got this right one. And these relationships use both of those, balance those two. This is how we're really meant to function, to balance those two. And a relationship like with this entomologist, it's so fulfilling. It's so fulfilling to have a relationship like that. And do science that matters and, and watch his graduate students get awards when they go to the Entomological Society of America because of the exciting research that they're describing, that they're working on. I mean, that, it's really hard to beat that. And I think for me in my career, it came because I just, I love people. <laughs> and I like to interact with people. Uh, and, then, and this, and there's, and university is such a beautiful environment for doing this. It's, it's, it's a natural environment. You have a social life in this institution. You have opportunity to meet these different people, to run into people that you, that you click with, and just start doing something together. It's, it's, it, it just naturally kind of flows out because all of us are excited about what we're doing. That's why we're here. It's kind of, so it's, it's not really the science that, for me, drove this whole thing. It was the relationships, the human relationships. Yeah. Do you think that you can teach that? Can you teach the loving of people, the building of relationships, particularly to people who have spent a majority of their academic careers and trajectories really inwardly focused on one thing? So the question is, can you teach uh, somebody to uh, value relationships this highly and to, to use the academic opportunities that we have to, to get relationships that gel like this, that, that, uh, that are synergistic. Both people get more out of it than either of them would get alone. I think it's possible to teach that to graduate students. I really do. And I think that it has to be modeled by the advisor. The, the advisor has to value that. The relationship between, a, between me as an advisor and the graduate students that I worked with that's a special relationship. It's a really powerful, special relationship. Most graduate students are, are at an age where they're open to possibilities, new possibilities, uh, especially if those new possibilities overlap with some things they already value highly and you you get the synergy between a different way of doing things and a traditional idea of what your academic training is like. So a student comes in with some expectation for what they're going to be doing. As an advisor, it's important to pick up that sense from each student. What is it that I think they're looking for? in here. What, what do they want out of their experience? And then I think on the other side of that is what do I have to offer them? And do these overlap? And you try to make this decision in an interview, you know, or maybe it's on the telephone. 
right? Or maybe a Zoom interview. Or maybe they come and visit. And you, you have this really short period when you, when you try to get a sense of this. Um, and I think that that relationship is, can be a really powerful relationship between an advisor and a student. Life-changing. And it can be life-changing for both people. I've had students who changed me. <laughs> All right? I mean, just because of who they are. I think it, I think it can happen at the graduate student level. I think if it goes as it seems the most common way they go, which is sort of do what I do. I'm the advisor. I know what's going on here. Do what I do, you know, however I do it. And you model the way you do research. And if the student objects to that, they go somewhere else. Right? And that's not the way I work with students. At least it's not the way I tried to work with students. I always tried to treat a student as my colleague. Right? Because students don't realize, I probably shouldn't let the cat out of the bag here, <laughs> but students don't realize that a lot of times they know more than their advisor does. But they have a lot less experience. And experience will trump knowledge any time they collide. And so you, you think your advisor is way ahead of you, but, but they're not. And if, it, as an advisor, you give that responsibility to that student, help them, be there, provide assistance, resources, whatever is required for that. But it's their responsibility 90% of the students step up to that in a, in a powerful way. So I think this is something that can happen then. I think once, once a person gets indoctrinated into this academic system, it's pretty hard. I don't think it's going to happen. Um, yeah. Um, do you think that proximity has anything to do with collaboration? Because you mentioned this, you know, entomologist that you worked with for 10 years while you were at that university, the, the collaboration has continued. Proximity. So but, like if you're, you know, in the same department, in the same college, the same university. Oh. Like being in person. So does it, does it matter that you're in physical proximity to each other? Like the same department or college or university? Um, I think it works in any of those cases. Because when the relationship becomes, the, becomes a really important part of, of the science that you're learning, of the, of the technology you're using, um, of the relation that that relationship affects every aspect of what you're doing together, and I think that can happen in the same department. I mean, most of my students were, I'd say half of them were in my my department. Um, so, some of them were in meteorology because I had a joint appointment in meteorology. Uh, some were more in different departments, like entomology, but still the same college. Um, I was on quite a few committees of students. Probably, oh, probably three times as many committees as I had students myself. So probably 150 students in 38 years. Um, and those, those often ended up with a very good relationship as well. They often gelled. Um, and they would be across campus, some of them on another campus. I think it can happen if the, if the relationship is the dominant element of this work. I think it can happen across almost any physical configuration. 
Um, yeah. What happens when these relationships don't gel? Do you have any experience where you butted heads with a collaborator, and how did you deal with that? Let's see if I can think of one. Can you repeat the question? Oh, repeat the question. Thank you. <laughs> uh, what happens when the relationship doesn't gel? <laughs> um, I think. It, I think in my case, um, I don't know if, if you, I learned something about myself five years ago, maybe seven years ago, that explained a whole lot of things to me about my life. And I'm in my 70s and I learned this. Right? It's that I'm what, what some psychiatrists and psychologists call an empath. Uh, you know what an empath is? Uh, does everyone know what an empath is? Looks like everybody does. Okay, well I didn't until five years ago. <laughs> In fact, I never even heard the word, all right? Well, what happens is if, if that's something that gets cultivated in your life, and I cultivated it, without knowing what it was. It was a natural kind of a thing. You, you pick up on relationships pretty fast. In fact, you feel what other people feel. So I could tell pretty early if, the, if something was going to gel or not going to gel. Um, I had a sense you know, a few hours with somebody, I had a pretty good sense about how this was going to work. And there were some students I worked with that I wasn't sure about on that. And it was harder. But it, I think it still worked for both of us. It just took longer. It didn't happen within the first semester. It wasn't a working relationship right away. It might take a year for that to form. But it would form. I had some failures. I had some really, really good students I would have loved to work with. And I know I could have. And I know it would have dealt. But they decided they didn't want to do that. They didn't want to do the various options that I had available for them to, to do. But they wanted to, one of them wanted to work in medicine. <laughs> and there's no way I'm gonna work in medicine. And so I did, I did my best to help them make connections with people in the medical college to get there. And so it, it cost a, a semester assistantship and some time. So that happens. Um, I've had some who just didn't apply themselves to it, that I thought if they had, this really could have worked. But they were more interested in actually something else. I mean, girls or, you know, things that didn't relate to their academic career. I mean, so I had to chase them down all the time. That's not going to work. So in a semester, they left. A mutually agreeable departure. I probably had half a dozen of those in my career. And they're hard. They're hard because you, you would have liked to have it had it work. So it's disappointing. Um, but it happens. Um, but certainly many more of them work than failed. But failure is an option. Uh, in the back, yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting that you say that it's the, the relationships, it's the sort of openness to an affection for other people that is the base of the ability to do is interdisciplinary. And I sort of have two questions about that. No one has ever said that before, and I never would have thought about it. 
but I think I get it, you know, that if you're just curious about the way other people see the world and you find them interesting, you bumble into these interesting things to do. Um, so I wonder, uh, you were asked if, if we can teach that, and it seems like maybe we should worry about whether we teach in a way that obstructs that, that pushes people away from that by telling them to be very tunnel vision about their own research, not not explore around and see what other people think, um, and also being often very competitive with both um, young faculty, early career faculty, and with grad students. So asking questions like, you know, who really did the work? Who's really the best? Whose idea was this? Uh, who, who's the important person? I think those would, are very destructive of being able to build relationships. Do you think that's perhaps problematic? And we maybe don't just model the way to be effectively interdisciplinary, and, but we perhaps model behaviors that push it away, that make it impossible. Wow, how do I summarize that? <laughs> <laughs> so what you're asking, I think, is do the academic traditions discourage people from establishing the kind of relationships that are required to do interdisciplinary work? And my answer to that is a resounding yes. It is. If you look back in our history of science, all the way back to Newton, Copernicus, I mean, even back to the Greeks, the powerful minds wanted to be recognized for it. And they had reputations that they used to their advantage. I mean, in, Certainly Newton was this way. I see Newton as really establishing the, uh, how would you say, the, the paradigm for a research scientist. I mean, the added quantification to the whole process, which is crucial in, in science, um, but he, also had an ego, a big ego. And I have a big ego, okay, I know that. <laughs> but I fight that. I, I, don't, I don't like that part of my own personality. I know it's there, and I have to be careful with it. Um, I think it's hard, sometimes it's hard to avoid that. And this notion of individual credit and who's best at this and who's be not, you know, who's a second, a second order scientist and this pecking order and all this stuff, it's all nonsense. It really is nonsense. And it's discouraging in interdisciplinary work. Because if you're going to work with somebody else, there has to be a mutual respect there. I mean, and I always encouraged my students to write the first draft of the paper. You write the first draft. I don't care how good or how bad it is. You write the first draft, you're the first author. Right? And they do it. They do it. And sometimes it's quite a while before the final draft gets completed. Right? Um, but they do it, and they're the first author. I want them to be the first author. I want them to have credit for it. So when, when I did this work with a graduate student to, to characterize the systematic nature of how eddy covariance underestimated the surface fluxes that were being measured by it, that student's name went on there. and so. The, the 1,700 citations for that paper at this point, which was published in 2000, she's attached to it. It's her reputation. And she called up when she got tenure and she said, thank you for letting her be the first author, all right? Because it really gave her a boost in here because when the bean counters came along and they were counting how many <laughs> citations she had, she had a lot of citations. 
right? And I want to do those kinds of, I want to see those kinds of things happen to the students I work with and to my colleagues. And it was common, sometimes we, we would, re when I would work, pick a colleague to work with or the two of us decide to work on something together, sometimes we would talk about authorship before we got very far into it and agree on how it was going to go. Most of the time we didn't do that. And when it came time to sit down and, and say, okay, who's first and who's second? My feeling about, was, about it was, well, why don't you do it, you do it first? Because if he does it first, then he's got to take care of all the reviews. He's got to take care of responding <laughs> to reviewers, right? He's got to edit the final versions. He's got to do all the work, right? I just as soon find another student and start the process over again. All right, because the relationship is number one for me. So if I'm further down the pecking order, that's, what's the difference? Um, in the beginning, it made a difference because when I went to Nebraska, they counted percentages according to how far down your name was. Right? And that, that was really irritating. And I let them know that that was not a really a very sensible thing to do because you don't have any idea what the, what, who, who matters the most on that authorship. The only people who know that are probably people's, people with the big ego. I mean, you all work together on this thing, but you need to decide on an order. And to me, it was more important for the relationship to be strengthened by this discussion about the author order than for it to fragment. I mean, and it has to be the, I really believe it has to be the first issue that is important to you if you're going to do interdisciplinary work because you've got to work with this person a lot and exchange a lot and see the world the way they see the world and they need to see the world the way you see the world. So, good question, really good question, because in science, we have a lot of traditions that are counterproductive for doing interdisciplinary work, and it doesn't get done. I mean, how many times have people sent in interdisciplinary proposals and then each person does his piece, right? They're really multidisciplinary proposals. They're not inter, they're multi. And I think that the schism between the disciplines is a major impediment to understanding reality. I really do, because to me reality is unity. Everything in reality is going on simultaneously, right, all over the universe. It's all happening instantaneously, right? We think in cause and effect because we're buried in this time paradigm. But that's not the way the world really works. It's all happening simultaneously, synchronously. So it's like one great big unit. And then we fragment this thing. And where do the boundaries come? The boundaries come in the hard part, right? The discipline starts on the easy problems. Those are the only ones you can tackle in the beginning because you don't know anything. So what happens? Eventually, you end up with the most important parts of the system you don't know anything about. It doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. Um, and I can also re recognize that not everybody is going to be geared this way. And it's okay. It's just that we need some people oriented this way, more than we have. So, yeah. So my, my following question is, can it be taught? But, but from, from that, how do we teach it? And the reason I say that is because as a major professor or someone trying to 
assemble or lead a multidisciplinary team, you run into students whose whole academic career has been COVID and Zoom meetings and no actual interpersonal. It, you know, I learned it from sitting across the desk from a professor even as an undergrad, which we haven't been able to do for the last three and a half years. So the question is, how do we how do we model that with someone that came through their academic career so far in, in post-COVID times? I think that, okay, how do we model it? Huh? Can you please repeat the question? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, this is a hard challenge for me. <laughs> um, <clears throat> how do you teach people to value relationships? And the only response I have to that is to model it. <laughs> yeah. If you want to do interdisciplinary research, you're going to have to want to have these kind of relationships. And I, for me, it all boils down, you know, to one four-letter word. I mean, it's all about loving our neighbor, right? And what does that mean? I mean, and it means exchanging with that person giving part of yourself to them and accepting part of them themselves in, in your own being, in your own life. And it's, I think it's a deep thing. It's a mysterious thing. Um, I don't, I guess the only way I can perceive this process happens is to model it, is to, is to be it. And I think it's important to want to be it. Um, a lot of this has to do with, for, for me, the way science is practiced now is about knowledge. It's about accumulating knowledge of the environment, the world we live in, of, of people, of possibilities, of technology, of many things. Bits and pieces that we put together. It's mostly knowledge, some understanding. Understanding is required if we're going to integrate this knowledge, if we're going to bring it together and make whole concepts out of it. And a lot of that is theoretical work, modeling work, virtual kind of work. You do the experiments to connect yourself to the reality, and then you link these pieces together however you can put them together. But there's one more element of, of living, and that's wisdom. And I don't see much wisdom in science. In science, if you can do it, you do it. If it's going to destroy the world, you do it anyway. Because maybe it won't destroy the world. I'm reading the book about the making of the bomb, and now I suppose watching the movie is a good example. Um, it just forged ahead, even though you know, it meant disaster and there was a lot of regret. Wisdom is a very powerful thing, and I think these relationships that happen between people who come together that gel like this, there's, a, there's wisdom embedded in that relationship. And I struggled with what wisdom means, you know, with the definition of wisdom. It's not an easy word to, to define. There's lots of definitions of it, but I came across this one by a man who I've only encountered in the recent history, I mean in the recent two months. His name is uh, Ian McGilchrist. And he's saying that wisdom is the ability to apply your experience to to new actions, 
to new activities. Applying what your experiences are in your life to new things that aren't so obvious how to do that application. It's also about knowing context. Wisdom is about knowing context. Context is a tough subject because it's a right hemisphere subject. It's something that's not easy to define. We all know what it is. We can have a conversation. There's a context in our dynamic right here now. There's a context here. It's very different if I sit down and talk to you, just you, and we have a conversation here about something. That's a different context, completely different context, right? You're going to say different things. You're going to function different ways. Context is a nebulous thing, and it's not carried in the language. The, lang the syntax of the language does not carry the context in it. It's mysterious what the context is, but it's crucial to a relationship. And the, the third thing that is required for wisdom is to have a foreknowledge of consequences. When you interact with someone, there's consequences all the time. There's, there's context and there's consequences. And to be aware of those things and to know what consequences are important to you. I mean, the way you say something can completely destroy a relationship. One sentence can destroy years of interaction. And <laughs> I think it takes a, just a will to want to have it somehow. I don't know how you teach it. It's a really good question. because I never thought about that question. But I think it's very hard to teach. And maybe this is part of the reason it's not common. It's hard to figure out. Yeah. One, one oh. more. One more question, yeah. and then we're out of time. Oh, OK. What was the process of coming up with the two source energy balance? How you guys work together and satellites coming up in the 90s, all that? Oh, oh the, the last question. <laughs> Martha will enjoy this. Uh, it's actually my lecture on Wednesday. <laughs> oh, okay. But John, please. How, how did this relationship come up between Bill and I that led to the two source energy balance model. And uh, that, that's a real interesting, there's a real interesting history there. Thermal infrared remote sensing was on the chopping block, all right? The experiments had been done, NASA had supported them. The thermal was so complicated they're going to get rid of it off of the Landsat satellite. They're going, to, they're going to fund less thermal research. And there were a group of us, and Bill and I were both in that group, but we didn't really, we never met at that point. There was a, a group, and, and there was some leadership within this thermal infrared community, people who knew everybody. They organized a meeting in southern France if you know about the French, there's no better place to have an international meeting than France, I'll tell you. They know how to throw a meeting and how to make things work. I had it collected together researchers from around the world in thermal infrared remote sensing. Well, uh, fairly early on in the meeting, there got to be a controversy about, uh, about how to represent a vegetation canopy in a way that is complex enough to capture the important variables, but not so complex that it's unwieldy and you can't, it's not easy to use, right? 
And there was a difference of opinion about how to do this. And Bill was on one side of that, and I was on the other side of that. And we, we chewed up a good deal of the time in one day arguing about this uh, pretty actively, right, would you say? Pretty actively. And finally, the head of the meeting said, well, look, you two guys go away and resolve this, and the rest of us are going to continue with the other topics on this three-day meeting. That was Toby Carlson. It was Toby Carlson from Penn State. I knew Toby really well at that time because I'd spent six years at Penn State in the department with Toby. And so we went off and... But immediately, when we got together, we weren't arguing anymore. We were trying to work to, to resolve this, all right? So there was a natural relationship here. When we were in the big group, we argued. We were trying to win our case, all right, or defend our position. But when we went into this side meeting with just the two of us, we realized we need to resolve this thing. And so we worked together to do that. And we did. It came out of that meeting, sort of on the back of napkins and envelopes and whatever you had to scribble on. And I, I think you saved some of that stuff. <laughs> you saved some of that. Bill is organized. I'm not organized, OK? I'm not an organized person at all. Um, and I need other people around me to, to keep order, all right? Because I'll just go off on another problem right now. <laughs> right? Right? And, and students did that for me, so I needed them to be there. I, I think a lot of them realized they, that I needed them to, to keep order in this thing and keep track of the data and the details. And, and Bill does that, right? And saved some of that old stuff. <laughs> it's just startling to see it. But there was a relationship there that gelled the minute we went off by ourselves, and we started to work together. I knew this was somebody that I could work with and I would really like to work with. And we worked, had worked together for 20 years. And it's been the most productive part of my career. The biggest chunk of those 34,000 are with Bill and with Martha, who's listening, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and uh, George Dyack and John Mesikulski. I mean, they're, they're people we worked with that were important people. Um, and that two source led, from the two source energy balance model, it led to the, to the schemes that were developed that went all the way to the continental scale. So there's these remote sensing tools now that will go from a meter pixel size and a, you know, a little patch of land, your backyard, for example, at a meter resolution, all the way to the continental United States. And <clears throat> with, a, with a nested scheme that can go down to that meter, anywhere, in principle, anywhere in the world. And the two-source energy balance is a key part of that whole process. And it just came out of the relationships of the people. You think about the people involved. It was the people that mattered here, the personal relationships between people. Why? Just talk. <laughs> <laughs> Let's thank Dr. Dorn.
Thanks for being a great audience. <laughs> Can I grab your mic? That was 